Thank you. Um, as she said, uh, I'm a speech language pathologist. Uh, so is Megan. Our colleague Meg Lister also helped us prepare this. She wasn't able to be here today. Um, as speech language pathologists, we have our own jargon. So if there is jargon that we're using that you're not familiar with, I know it's a big room, but stand up and jump up and down and flag us down, and we will answer your questions. Um, so I, I love this group because it, it tackles reading from so many different directions. Um, and the direction that we're coming from today is a language-focused direction. Um, and the reason that we do that is because when we're dealing with reading, reading is printed language. There are two modalities that we're familiar with for language, spoken and printed. One of those is learned naturally, it's innate. The other one has to be taught to you. Um, you can imagine that if uh, a child has difficulty with the naturally acquired innate form of language, that learning then this other modality of language, a printed form, could be uh, particularly difficult for those kids. So um, we're actually going to start out by talking about children who may be younger than many of you are used to dealing with. We're actually going to start in infancy and work our way up uh, into school age. So um, just to give you a little bit of background, we want to make sure that uh, we are clinicians, we use clinical terminology, um, so we want to start out just by uh, going over the term dyslexia. I'm not sure that you guys actually covered this in the last two um, uh, presentations, so um, I want to start out with just a couple of uh, questions. Is dyslexia something that only affects people who speak English? Um, Dyslexia may be more common in uh, English than it is in some other languages because we have such a weird mapping between letters and sounds. We have so many irregularities, uh, but dyslexia certainly isn't uh, only present in English. Children will outgrow dyslexia. What do you think? No. Uh, there isn't any evidence for this. Uh, we know that children with reading problems uh, will continue to have reading problems, and it can persist their whole life. Um, so the wait and see approach uh, generally is not uh, favored. Um, dyslexia is a lifelong condition. Many of you may know adults who are adults with dyslexia and they still continue to have difficulty um, with reading. Um, but there is a large body of evidence that shows that the type of instructions uh, that struggling readers receive can actually help them to overcome some of the difficulties that they may have. Uh, dyslexia, is it caused by problems with visual perception? This is actually, uh, I, I tend to get this question all the time. Um, dyslexia is actually not a visual processing problem. It's actually a problem in the brain, how the brain manages uh, language, how it connects spoken and printed language. And is the hallmark of dyslexia that kids write letters backwards? This is a smart group. You've been doing your job. Okay. Um, there may be some reversals in letters, but letter reversals um, are part of uh, normal um, development as children are learning to, uh, to spell. And so for some children with dyslexia, some of those reversals may persist a little bit longer, but we, we typically are not diagnosing dyslexia based on letter reversals. So if it's not a visual processing problem, um, should we be using colored text overlays and eye exercises and a dyslexia font to try to overcome dyslexia? Uh, again, that's not the preferred approach. Um, there isn't strong research indicating that using uh, colored overlays, that using a special font is going to uh, uh, help children who have dyslexia. Really what will help children who have dyslexia is dealing with the core problem, which is um, understanding how they represent uh, speech and language in their head. Okay, so if we just talked about what dyslexia isn't, what is it? What is it? Before I throw up a definition. What are some of the words that you might expect to see in a definition? Good. Disconnect in the processing of language. Yep. Good. 
Okay, good. The word phonological just showed up. Thank you. Okay. Um, so dyslexia, uh, this is from the International Dyslexia Association. It's neurobiological in origin, meaning it's in the brain. Um, it tends to run in families, um, so there are some genetic components to it. Uh, dyslexia is characterized by difficulty with accurate and fluent word recognition. That's sort of the symptom. Um, and by poor spelling and poor decoding abilities. And the difficulties result from deficits in the phonological components of language. Um, and so those difficulties have to be compared to something. So difficulty relative to the child's age, to their cognitive skills, um, and those difficulties are not accounted for by a lack of instruction or a lack of exposure to, uh, to uh, good instruction. So if we can all agree that the word language should probably show up in the, uh, in the definition of dyslexia and uh, the word phonology, um, then let's talk a little bit about some of the foundations for reading. Um, Think about what the brain has to do uh, to process those letters. Um, if we're trying to read, we're taking those letters through our eyes and then connecting what we see to some sort of representation in the brain. Uh, we have to recognize that that's a word and that it uh, has meaning. Um, and when we're reading, we might then see it and then speak it. We might look at those letters and say, that says dress. Um, but remember, uh, Reading is just one modality. The other modality is through spoken language, okay? And so essentially what's happening with uh, spoken language, we are processing spoken language essentially in the same parts of the brain that we are processing printed language. So you can imagine that if there is some weakness in how we're processing spoken language, then there are likely to be some weaknesses in how we manage printed language. Um, I'm gonna give you a two minute neuroscience lesson. Um, this is a picture of a child um, who's uh, going into an MRI. Uh, this is a functional MRI that's uh, going to see what's happening in the brain. Um, so uh, this is from a study that uh, we recently published. We presented kids with uh, printed language, like dress, and spoken language, like dress. So they saw it and they heard uh, those words, and essentially we tried to map in the brain uh, what's going on when they're dealing with both sp spoken and printed language. Um, so you can imagine that there's this uh, beautifully colored map, and I'm sure you can all interpret this perfectly, right? Um, what I want you to think about for a second is uh, if you're processing spoken language, let's say here, and you're processing printed language over here, then there's no overlap in how the, that's being processed. Okay? Uh, but what we see is the areas that are in red are regions that are, that are engaged for both spoken and printed language processing. And you see a lot of red on that brain. Okay? There's a huge part of the brain that's used uh, to manage both spoken and printed language. There are some parts of the brain that are used only to manage uh, spoken language, some that are used only to manage printed language. But the overlap is the important part, the part that's in red. And what we found was that actually kids who have more of that red, meaning there's more overlap in their brain and how they process spoken and printed language, those are kids who are going to be really strong readers two years later. We are able to predict how good kids were at reading based on some of the brain activation patterns that we saw. And if it was a kid who had very little red there, meaning there wasn't a lot of overlap between how they managed spoken and printed language, that that was a child who was gonna go on to have some reading difficulties later on. So the main point of this is just to tell you that the, the way that the brain manages uh, reading um, needs to connect with the way that the brain manages spoken language. So the foundation for learning to read really is uh, through um, starting with spoken language. Um, this is a slide that we stole from last time, uh, I think from Kristen and from uh, Maria on the simple view of reading. Um, so I think you guys have talked about this a couple of times now. So the simple view of reading essentially uh, recognizes that reading comprehension is the end goal of reading. Um, and that can be sort of deconstructed into word recognition and into language comprehension. Um, the automatic word recognition piece of it really is be being a rapid, a fluent uh, reader and decoder. Um, and that boils down to things like phonemic proficiency, um, decoding, and letter sound knowledge. 
But the language comprehension side really has its foundation in oral language. Um, so both the phonemic proficiency and the vocabulary knowledge and the background knowledge uh, that children bring to reading comes from their spoken language abilities. So uh, Maria wanted us to talk a little bit about uh, some red flags um, in terms of uh, children's speech and language development and how that might relate to uh, reading uh, difficulties. So we're going to start with um, a few reading or, or a few uh, speech and language milestones, and uh, these are ones that we've selected that are known to connect with um, with reading difficulty. Uh, so as I said, language really is. Uh, has two modalities to it that we're familiar with, both spoken and printed. The spoken piece is the part that's learned naturally. That's got to be solid uh, for children to uh, manage printed language. Um, one of the things that I uh, often tell my students that they think is kind of cool is that we can actually prevent reading disabilities. Uh, if we identify kids when they're young, before they've even started to learn to read, we can identify kids with speech and language problems when they're three or four. We provide good intervention. Those kids respond well to that intervention. We can prevent them from having reading difficulties. So early identification of difficulties is really important because we, we, we can't ever prove that we prevented it because we don't know exactly where a child would have gone. Um, but certainly the data tells us that if we provide intervention early on in preschool uh, for children who have speech and language difficulties, they we can prevent them from having uh, reading and spelling difficulties. Um, so we can either think about how do children talk when they're young and deal with preventing problems, or we can wait and see and provide intervention later on uh, when children are trying to learn to read and they're suffering academically. So um, again, my preference would be identify kids when they're young. Let's try to prevent difficulties from even emerging. Okay. So we're going to uh, talk about some of the red flags that we're looking for. So we can actually start in infancy and recognize a few behaviors. Again, there's no perfect one-to-one -one correspondence between what's happening um, with an infant and what's going to happen uh, when the child is uh, five or six in school. Uh, but we can pay attention to things like babbling. Many of you have children. Many of you have seen children who babble and they say, ba di ba ba di ba that's not too bad when the child's 10, but if we have a, a when the child's 10 months old, <laughs> not too. But if the child's 10 months old and their babbling just consists of ba, what's the difference between those two? The number of sounds they're using, the length, the number of syllables that they're producing, okay? So if a child's babbling is restricted to just one syllable and maybe only one consonant they're using, that they're only using the book consonant, um, that can actually be a red flag, and we can uh, look for that when children are 10 months old, because the typical age where we start to see um, this uh, type of babbling should be in the window of about six to nine months. So if the child's 10 months and all they're doing yet is still ba, and they don't do it very often, they very rarely babble, that's actually a red flag. Uh, we have pretty good data that indicates that that child is likely to ha have some speech and language difficulties uh, later on. So that's one type of red flag. Uh, then we get into the stages where children actually are talking. Um, toddlers uh, are talking around the age of 24 months, the age of two years. Um, we expect kids to be able to put two words together to form really primitive sentences. Um, and we expect kids to have at least uh, about 50 words in their vocabulary that they can speak, that they can produce, that are recognizable. They don't have to be perfect, but they need to be able to um, pr attempt many different words. So if by 24 months we're not seeing 50 words or anything close to 50 words, that's potentially a red flag. And if children aren't starting to combine words into simple sentences, that's another potential red flag. And there's pretty good uh, longitudinal evidence that if we see these signs at the age of two and we follow this, those kids up at the age of seven or eight or nine, Guess who those kids are who at seven or eight or nine have reading difficulties? It's often kids who, at this age, weren't yet forming two-word combinations and had uh, limited vocabularies. 
Um, so we might see some kids who at the age of two are sh forming short sentences, like modut peas. That would be pretty normal of a two-year-old. Uh, two but we might also have some kids who just say do, and everything is just one word, and they're not combining words together. That is potentially a red flag if we're not seeing evidence of word combinations. So when we're thinking about toddlers, there are simple things that can be done to try to intervene at this age. Um, talking to the child is probably the most important thing. Okay. So uh, some simple strategies are to notice what the child's doing. What's the child interested in? What toy are they interested in? What food are they interested in? Um, are they interested in throwing stuff on the floor? It doesn't really matter. We can attach language to anything. Even if the child's throwing a temper tantrum, we can attach language to that. And that's essentially the way that we can try to help uh, move children along is to notice what the child's interested in, what they're doing, respond to a child's attempts to communicate. Even if they're just pointing and they're not using a lot of verbal language, we could, that's still an attempt to communicate. If they point at their juice or at their milk or at a book, that's an attempt to communicate and we can respond by giving the child language. If the child points at their favorite toy, here, this is Teddy, big Teddy. Or, uh, this is a ball, a big ball, a little ball, a round ball. We want to try to mirror the child's actions. So if the child attempts to say a word, we can say that word right back and we can expand on it. The child says, do for juice, we can say, want juice? So we give the child, they said one word, we give them a response that's two words, to, just to try to teach them uh, to add more words and to combine uh, uh, words to form sentences. When we're working with young children, we need to make sure that we are following their lead, we are attending to what they're interested in, and we're adding a language to what they're interested in. When we're working with toddlers, we don't want to go in with too much of an agenda, we want to just follow the child's lead. We don't want to say, oh, it's time to work with this book, today we're going to work with this book. Well, if the child doesn't want to work with the book and they want to play with the toy, we can still add language to the child's attempts to play with the toy. Uh, a good description that I've heard of um, how we might go about this is to play communication catch. The child throws and you catch, and you throw back to the child and they try to catch. So it's essentially making sure that there's a back and forth in language, that it's my turn, no, now it's your turn, now it's my turn, now it's your turn, so that you're giving the child an attempt to interact and uh, make it a back and forth exchange. During the preschool age, um, we want to pay attention to the clarity of a child's speech. Um, by about four years of age, we should be able to understand everything a child is saying. That doesn't mean everything sounds perfect, but we should be, a child should be intelligible. We should be able to understand that the child says, modus please, that's intelligible, that's understandable. So by the age of four, we really should um, see uh, that the child's attempts to communicate are recognizable to unfamiliar people, not just to the parents, but to unfamiliar listeners, to the, to the teachers and to their peers. Um, and you, we might still see errors. So in this case, uh, we see this child saying something like, please, that's okay at the age of four. Um, but sometimes we come across children who have some rather unusual speech patterns and say things like, oh, who's ease? That's not a typical, there are errors there, and there were errors in the first example, but the second one has some rather unusual speech errors. And again, I'm not expecting you all to be speech language pathologists, but if you recognize, hmm, that just doesn't sound like other kids of that age, then referring to speech language pathologists, they can start to identify what, what's the problem here. Why is this child using some rather unusual speech errors at that age? And those unusual speech errors can be a red flag. I spent four years doing a dissertation to prove this. So um, those, those, um, those unusual speech errors are related to poor phonological awareness in preschoolers. Um, in terms of terminology, I want to start with um, some terms that you might have heard before but might not have total clarity on what they are. So um, I'm going to try to give you an overview, but again, um, jump up and ask me questions if you're not sure. Um, so you've probably heard terms like speech disorder and language disorder, and are those the same thing? Okay. To us, those are not exactly the same thing, um, to speech language pathologists. So we're going to start with uh, describing language impairments. Language impairments can be receptive or expressive, 
meaning receptive, meaning what you understand of spoken language, and expressive, how you're using spoken language. Um, the hallmark, certainly in preschool and in young school age kids, uh, of language impairment is difficulty expressing oneself, particularly with weak grammar. Um, so difficulty uh, forming complete sentences. Okay. Um, many of those children also have a restricted vocabulary, so they have difficulty being specific about what they want to say, or they have difficulty um, getting their point across, uh, clearly using language. Um, receptively, children may, with language impairment may have difficulty understanding uh, what's said to them. They may have some difficulty following directions in your classroom. Um, and some examples uh, of uh, what preschoolers, uh, four-year-old with language impairment might say is something like, me go home, or cat say meow. Those are incomplete sentences, right? Those are not grammatically well-formed. So language impairment is clearly a red flag. Um, this is something that uh, is very, very, very strongly tied with later reading difficulties. So recognizing uh, difficulty with spoken language when children are in preschool, if we get them into the system, we get them help early on, we can prevent later reading difficulties. So how is that different from a speech impairment? Think of speech as sort of the mechanism of your mouth. Okay? It's using your tongue and your lips and your jaw to form speech sounds. Okay? So that's not really the, the grammar side, it's not the vocabulary side, it's getting your mouth to form sounds properly. So speech impair, uh, a speech sound disorder is the term that's being used now. Um, many of you though are familiar with terms like articulation disorder and phonological disorder and childhood apraxia of speech. All those fall under the general umbrella of some sort of speech sound disorder. A child with difficulty pronouncing sounds, a child uh, who talked quite dead, who is difficult to understand. They, they're producing lots of errors in their pronunciation. Um, so the sort of the hallmark of speech sound disorders is difficulty uh, getting those sounds clearly out. Um, those children tend to be difficult for strangers to understand. Okay, so imagine a preschooler whose teacher just says, "I Johnny is." trying to tell me something I just never can quite figure out what, what it is. Um, those tend to be children who have uh, speech sound disorders. Um, sometimes their, their speech is described as just immature or baby-like. Um, so you might get children who say something like, I go home, I go home, not I go home, I go home. Or uh, the cat said meow, instead of the cat said meow. Clearly the sounds are not correct there. Um, that also is a red flag for literacy problems, although I will say in general, the one on the left, language impairment, tends to be more strongly related to later language difficulties than speech impairment, um, but that's sort of, uh, that's kind of at the group level, not at the level of one individual. And I'm sure you've heard of stuttering as well as another type of speech disorder. Um, so stuttering is when children might prolong sounds or repeat sounds or repeat words. So they might say something like, the, 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 the cat says m -m -m meow. That's another speech disorder, but it's not one that tends to be terribly strongly tied to reading difficulties. Okay? So it's primarily language impairment and primarily speech sound disorders, um, but that doesn't mean that you can't stutter and have a reading, reading difficulty. Of course you can. Um, the main uh, the main domain where we would see this impact um, reading is in reading fluency, right? Speeded, rapid reading, because there would be lots of pauses and hesitations. So as a quick recap of uh, some of the uh, speech and language difficulties that can be related to dyslexia, um, a speech sound disorder or phonological disorder is trouble pronouncing sounds and being understood, um, unclear speech. Um, it's pretty well uh, demonstrated that speech sound disorders tend to uh, be related to later difficulties with phonological awareness uh, that tends to then show up in difficulty with decoding words and with spelling. Children with language impairment, or you may hear, hear the term specific language impairment, so children with language impairment, um, children with language impairment uh, tend to have poor grammar, 
Greek vocabularies, uh, and they have difficulty um, uh, saying what they mean specifically and clearly. Um, they may have difficulty comprehending uh, what the teacher is saying or comprehending stories that are read to them. Um, and language impairment does tend to be very strongly related to difficulties with nearly every domain of literacy. Difficulty with decoding, difficulty with comprehension, difficulty with fluency, difficulty with spelling. Um, so uh, specific language impairment tends to be something that we know has uh, very significant um, impact on um, reading. So that gets two flags. Um, questions that often arise are, if I notice a problem, what do I do about it? Um, for children who are um, uh, zero, uh, zero to two, I guess, um, they uh, will re can receive services through early intervention. Early intervention is something that's uh, governed by each county in New York State. Every state does a little bit differently. Um, but uh, counties have early intervention systems, so if uh, parents notice that there's difficulty, or in some cases uh, you might work with a family and they have a younger sibling um, who's two and they notice difficulty, they can go to the early intervention uh, website, and that is on the handout on the first, bottom of the first page. Um, for children who are preschool age or above, um, they can uh, contact their school district, and the school district can provide evaluations if the parents say, I'm concerned about my child's speech or language. Um, they can get uh, free evaluations through the school district, and that link is just to um, some uh, Committee on Preschool Special Education Chairs. Um, so as a uh, brief summary here uh, of where we're at so far, um, I will direct your attention to the handout. We have some examples of some of those developmental milestones that I just hit, and some examples of what uh, can be done about, uh, some, some strategies that can be done to uh, help children. Um, and also at the bottom of that table, there's a link to some other checklists. So we sort of made a little checklist for you, but there's lots of other checklists in terms of what to look for in terms of early speech and language development. Um, and just to leave you here as a quick reminder, um, language involves two modalities, spoken and printed. If you're weak in one modality, chances are you're going to be weak in the other. So we can identify um, language difficulties in preschoolers. Uh, again, some of the things to look for in preschool. Uh, as children are kind of ending preschool, we want to make sure that they're using pronouns properly, like using you and me properly. That they have long enough sentences that they're not just using two or three words in their sentences. They should be using at least four or more words. Um, as children are ending preschool and getting into kindergarten, they should be adding endings to words. They should have all of those um, prefixes and suffixes, that, or at least the suffixes. They should be using things like ing and ed and plurals and possessives. Um, and as far as speech goes, again, as children are uh, in preschool around the age of four, we expect them to be nearly 100% intelligible. So their speech sounds uh, should be pronounced so that the, their, what they're saying is very recognizable, and you shouldn't have to struggle to figure out what a child's saying. 